Story 9, Part 1 of Lucy Maud Montgomery's Short Stories, 1907 to 1908. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Young. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1907 to 1908, by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Story 9, Four Winds, Part 1. Alan Douglas threw down his pen with an impatient exclamation. It was high time his next Sunday's sermon was written, but he could not concentrate his thoughts on his chosen text. For one thing, he did not like it, and had selected it only because Elder Trewin, in his call of the evening before, had hinted that it was time for a good, stiff doctrinal discourse, such as his predecessor in Rexton, the Rev. Yabez Strong, had delighted in. Alan hated doctrines. The soul's stay-laces, he called them, but Elder Trewin was a man to be reckoned with, and Alan preached an occasional sermon to please him. "'It's no use,' he said wearily. "'I could have written a sermon in keeping with the text in November or midwinter, but now, when the whole world is reawakening in a miracle of beauty and love, I can't do it. If a northeast rainstorm doesn't set in before next Sunday, Mr. Trewin will not have his sermon. I shall take as my text instead, The flowers appear on the earth.' The time of the singing of birds has come. He rose and went to his study window, outside of which a young vine was glowing in soft tender green tints, its small dainty leaves casting quivering shadows on the opposite wall, where the portrait of Alan's mother hung. She had a fine, strong, sweet face. The same face, cast in a masculine mould, was repeated in her son, and the resemblance was striking as he stood in the searching evening sunshine. The black hair grew around his forehead in the same way. His eyes were steel-blue like hers, with a similar expression, half-brooding, half-tender in their depths. He had the mobile, smiling mouth of the picture, but his chin was deeper and squarer, dented with a dimple which, combined with a certain occasional whimsicality of opinion and glance, had caused Elder Trewin some qualms of doubt regarding the fitness of this young man for his high and holy vocation. The Reverend Yavish Strong had never indulged in dimples or jokes. But then, as Elder Trowin, being a just man, had to admit, the Reverend Yabez Strong had preached many a time and oft to more empty pews than full ones, while now the church was crowded to its utmost capacity on Sundays, and people came to hear Mr. Douglas, who had not darkened the church door for years. All things considered, Elder Trowin decided to overlook the dimple. There was sure to be some drawback in every minister. Alan, from his study, looked down on all the length of the Rexton Valley at the head of which the manse was situated, and thought that Eden might have looked so in its innocence, for all the orchards were abloom, and the distant hills were tremulous and aerial in springtime gauzes of pale purple and pearl. But in any garden, despite its beauty, is an element of tameness and domesticity, and Alan's eyes, after a moment's delighted gazing, stayed wistfully off to the north, where the hills broke away into a long, sloping lowland of pine and fir. Beyond it stretched the wide expanse of the lake, flashing in the molten gold and crimson of evening. Its lure was irresistible. Alan had been born and bred beside a faraway sea, and the love of it was strong in his heart, so strong that he knew he must go back to it some time. Meanwhile, the great lake, mimicking the sea in its vast expanse, and the storms that often swept over it, was his comfort and solace. As often as he could, he stole away to its wild and lonely shore, leaving the snug bounds of cultivated homelands behind him with something like a sense of relief. Down there by the lake was a primitive wilderness, where man was as naught and man-made doctrines had no place. There one might walk hand in hand with nature, and so come very close to God. Many of Alan's best sermons were written after he had come home, rapt-eyed from some long shore tramp, where the wilderness had opened its heart to him, and the pines had called to him in their soft, sibilant speech. With a half-guilty glance at the futile sermon, he took his hat and went out. The sun of the cool spring evening was swinging low over the lake as he turned into the unfrequented, deep-rutted road leading to the shore. It was two miles to the lake, but halfway there, Alan came to where another road branched off and struck down through the pines in a northeasterly direction. He had sometimes wondered where it led, but he had never explored it. 
Now he had a sudden whim to do so, and turned into it. It was even rougher and lonelier than the other. Between the ruts the grasses grew long and thickly. Sometimes the pine boughs met overhead. Again the trees broke away to reveal wonderful glimpses of gleaming water, purple islets, dark feathery coasts. Still the road seemed to leave nowhere, and Alan was half repenting the impulse which had led him to choose it, when he suddenly came out from the shadow of the pines, and found himself gazing on a sight which amazed him. Before him was a small peninsula, running out into the lake, and terminating in a long sandy point. Beyond it was a glorious sweep of sunset water. The peninsula itself seemed barren and sandy, covered for the most part with scrub firs and spruces, through which the narrow road wound on to what was the astonishing feature in the landscape, a grey and weather-beaten house built almost at the extremity of the point, and shadowed from the western light by a thick plantation of tall pines behind it. It was the house which puzzled Alan. He had never known there was any house near the lake shore, had never heard mention made of any, yet here was one, and one which was evidently occupied, for a slender spiral of smoke was curling upward from it on the chilly spring air. It could not be a fisherman's dwelling, for it was large and built after a quaint, tasteful design. The longer Alan looked at it, the more his wonder grew. The people living here were in the bounds of his congregation. How then was it that he had never seen or heard of them? He sauntered slowly down the road until he saw that it led directly to the house and ended in the yard. Then he turned off in a narrow path to the shore. He was not far from the house now, and he scanned it observantly as he went past. The baron swept almost up to its door in front, but at the side, sheltered from the lake winds by the pines, was a garden where there was a fine show of gay tulips and golden daffodils. No living creature was visible, and, in spite of the blossoming geraniums and muslin curtains at the windows and the homely spiral of smoke, the place had a lonely, almost untenanted look. When Alan reached the shore, he found that it was of a much more open and less rocky nature than the part which he had been used to frequent. The beach was of sand, and the scrub barrens dwindled down to it almost insensibly. To right and left, fir-fringed points ran out into the lake, shaping a little cove with the house in its curve. Alan walked slowly toward the left headland, intending to follow the shore around to the other road. As he passed the point, he stopped short in astonishment. The second surprise and mystery of the evening confronted him. A little distance away, a girl was standing, a girl who turned a startled face at his unexpected appearance. Alan Douglas had thought he knew all the girls in Rexton, but this lithe, glorious creature was a stranger to him. She stood with her hand on the head of a huge, tawny collie dog. Another dog was sitting on his haunches beside her. She was tall, with a great braid of shining chestnut hair, showing ruddy, burnished tints where the sunlight struck it, hanging over her shoulder. The plain, dark dress she wore emphasized the grace and strength of her supple form. Her face was oval and pale, with straight black brows and a finely cut crimson mouth, a face whose beauty bore the indefinable stamp of race and breeding, mingled with a wild sweetness, as of a flower growing in some lonely and inaccessible place. None of the Rexton girls looked like that. Who, in the name of all that was amazing, could she be? As the thought crossed Alan's mind, the girl turned, with an air of indifference that might have seemed slightly overdone to a calmer observer than was the young minister at that moment, and, with a gesture of command to her dogs, walked quickly away into the scrub spruces. She was so tall that her uncovered head was visible over them as she followed some winding footpath, and Alan stood like a man rooted to the ground until he saw her enter the grey house. Then he went homeward in a maze, all thought of sermons, doctrinal or otherwise, for the moment knocked out of his head. She's the most beautiful woman I ever saw, he thought. How is it possible that I have lived in Rexton for six months and never heard of her or of that house? Well, I dare say there's some simple explanation of it all. The place may have been unoccupied until lately. Probably it is the summer residence of people who have only recently come to it. I'll ask Mrs. Danby. She'll know if anybody will. That good woman knows everything about everybody in Rexton for three generations back. Alan found Isabel King with his housekeeper when he got home. His greeting was tinged with a slight constraint. 
he was not a vain man but he could not help knowing that isabel looked upon him with a favour that had in it much more than professional interest isabel herself showed it with sufficient distinctness moreover he felt a certain personal dislike of her and of her hard insistent beauty which seemed harder and more insistent than ever contrasted with his recollection of the girl of the lake shore isabel had a trick of coming to the manse on plausible errands to mrs danby and lingering until it was so dark that alan was in courtesy bound to see her home the ruse was a little too patent and amused alan although he carefully hid his amusement and treated isabel with the fine unvarying deference which his mother had ingrained into him for womanhood a deference that flattered isabel even while it annoyed her with the sense of a barrier which she could not break down or pass she was the daughter of the richest man in rexton and inclined to give herself airs on that account but alan's gentle indifference always brought home to her an unwelcome feeling of inferiority you've been tiring yourself out again tramping that lake shore i suppose said mrs danby who had kept house for three bachelor ministers and consequently felt entitled to hector them in a somewhat maternal fashion not tiring myself resting and refreshing myself rather smiled alan i was tired when i went out but now i feel like a strong man rejoicing to run a race by the way mrs danby who lives in that quaint old house way down at the very shore i never knew of its existence before alan's by the way was not quite so indifferent as he tried to make it isabel king leaning back posingly among the cushions of the lounge sat quickly up as he asked his question dear me you don't mean to say you've never heard of captain anthony captain anthony oliver said mrs danby he lives down there at four winds as they call it he and his daughter and an old cousin isabel king bent forward her brown eyes on alan's face did you see lind oliver she asked with suppressed eagerness alan ignored the question perhaps he did not hear it have they lived there long he asked for eighteen years said mrs danby placidly it's funny you haven't heard them mentioned but people don't talk much about the captain now he's an old story and of course they never go anywhere not even to church the captain is a rank infidel and they say his daughter is just as bad to be sure nobody knows much about her but it stands to reason that a girl who's had her bringing up must be odd to say no worse of her it's not really her fault i suppose her wicked old scallywag of a father is to blame for it she's never darkened a church or school door in her life and they say she's always been a regular tomboy running wild outdoors with dogs and fishing and shooting like a man nobody ever goes there the captain doesn't want visitors he must have done something dreadful in his time if it was only known when he's so set on living like a hermit away down on that jumping-off place did you see any of them i saw miss oliver i suppose said alan briefly at least i met a young lady on the shore but where did these people come from surely more is known of them than this precious little the truth is mr douglas folks don't think the olivers respectable and don't want to have anything to do with them eighteen years ago captain anthony came from goodness knows where bought the four winds point and built that house he said he'd been a sailor all his life and couldn't live away from the water he brought his wife and child and an old cousin of his with him this lind wasn't more than two years old then people went to call but they never saw any of the women and the captain let them see they weren't wanted some of the men who'd been working round the place saw his wife and said she was sickly but real handsome and like a lady but she never seemed to want to see anyone or be seen herself there was a story that the captain had been a smuggler and that if he was caught he'd be sent to prison oh there were all sorts of yarns mostly coming from the men who worked there for nobody else ever got inside the house well four years ago his wife disappeared it wasn't known how or when she just was never seen again that's all whether she died or was murdered or went away nobody ever knew there was some talk of an investigation but nothing came of it as for the girl she's always lived there with her father she must be a perfect heathen he never goes anywhere but there used to be talk of strangers visiting him queer sort of characters who came up the lake in vessels from the american side i haven't heard any reports of such these past few years though not since his wife disappeared he keeps a yacht and goes sailing in it sometimes he cruises about for weeks and that's about all he ever does and now you know as much about the olivers as i do mr douglas alan had listened to this gossipy narrative with an interest that did not escape isabel king's observant eyes much of it he mentally dismissed as improbable surmise 
but the basic facts were probably as Mrs. Danby had reported them. He had known that the girl of the shore could be no commonplace, primly nurtured young woman. "'Has no effect ever been made to bring these people into touch with the church?' he asked absently. "'Bless you, yes. Every minister that's ever been in Rexton has had a try at it. The old cousin met every one of them at the door and told him nobody was home. Mr. Strong was the most persistent. He didn't like being beaten. He went again and again, and finally the captain sent him word that when he wanted parsons or pill-dosers, he'd send for them. Until he did, he'd thank them to mind their own business.' They say Mr. Strong met Lynn once along the shore, and wanted to know if she wouldn't come to church, and she laughed in his face, and told him she knew more about God now than he did or ever would. Perhaps the story isn't true, or if it was, maybe he provoked her into saying it. Mr. Strong wasn't overly tactful. I believe in judging the poor girl as charitably as possible, and making allowances for her, seeing how she's been brought up. You couldn't expect her to know how to behave. Somehow, Alan resented Mrs. Danby's charity. Then, his sense of humor being strongly developed, he smiled to think of this commonplace old lady making allowances for the splendid bit of femininity he had seen on the shore. A plump barnyard fowl might as well have talked of making allowances for a seagull. Alan walked home with Isabel King, but he was very silent as they went together down the long, dark, sweet-smelling country road, bordered by its white orchards. Isabel put her own construction on his absent replies to her remarks, and presently she asked him, "'Did you think Lind Oliver handsome?' The question gave Alan an annoyance out of all proportion to its significance. He felt an instinctive reluctance to discuss Lind Oliver with Isabel King. "'I saw her only for a moment,' he said coldly. "'But she impressed me as being a beautiful woman.' "'They tell queer stories about her.' "'But maybe they're not all true,' said Isabel, unable to keep the sneer of malice out of her voice. At that moment, Alan's secret contempt for her crystallized into pronounced aversion. He made no reply, and they went the rest of the way in silence. At her gate, Isabel said, "'You haven't been over to see us very lately, Mr. Douglas. "'My congregation is a large one, and I cannot visit all my people as often as I might wish,' Alan answered, all the more coldly for the personal note in her tone." A minister's time is not his own, you know. "'Shall you be going to see the Olivers?' asked Isabel bluntly. "'I have not considered that question. Good night, Miss King.' On his way back to the manse, Alan did consider the question. Should he make any attempt to establish friendly relations with the residents of Four Winds? It surprised him to find how much he wanted to, but he finally concluded that he would not. They were not adherents of his church, and he did not believe that even a minister had any right to force himself upon people who plainly wished to be let alone. When he got home, although it was late, he went to his study and began work on a new text, for Elder Trowen seemed utterly out of the question. Even with the new one, he did not get on very well. At last, in exasperation, he leaned back in his chair. "'Why can't I stop thinking of those four winds people?' Here, let me put these haunting thoughts into words and see if that will lay them. That girl had a beautiful face, but a cold one. Would I like to see it lighted up with the warmth of her soul set free? Yes, frankly, I would. She looked upon me with indifference. Would I like to see her welcome me as a friend? I have a conviction that I would, although no doubt everybody in my congregation would look upon her as a most unsuitable friend for me. Do I believe that she is wild, unwomanly, heathenish, as Mrs. Danby says? No, I do not, most emphatically. I believe she is a lady in the truest sense of that most abused word, though she is doubtless unconventional. Having said all this, I do not see what more there is to be said. And I am going to write this sermon. Alan wrote it, putting all thought of Lind Oliver sternly out of his mind for the time being. He had no notion of falling in love with her. He knew nothing of love and imagined that it counted for nothing in his life. He admitted that his curiosity was aflame about the girl, but it never occurred to him that she meant or could mean anything to him but an attractive enigma which once solved would lose its attraction. The young woman he knew in Rexton, whose simple, pleasant friendship he valued, had the placid domestic charm of their own sweet-breathed, windless orchards. Lind Oliver had the fascination of the lake shore wild, remote, untamed, the lure of the wilderness and the primitive. There was nothing more personal in his thought of her, and yet, when he recalled Isabel King's sneer, 
he felt an almost personal resentment. End of Four Winds, Part 1 Recording by Kristen Young, Amherst, Massachusetts